Welcome to the capstone event of Whidbey Reads 2021. Whidbey Reads is an annual community reading event funded through generous donations from the Clinton, Langley, Freeland, Coopville, and Oak Harbor Friends of the Library groups and supported by the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation. Our 2021 selection is Eruption by Steve Olson. Contact your local community library to request a copy. The ebook and e audiobook are available for instant checkout from our Overdrive catalog through May 31st. Your mics are muted. Please use chat to ask questions at any time. Steve Olson wants to hear your stories about the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Post them in chat along with your questions. We will share your stories and questions with Steve throughout tonight's event. Watch chat for links to relevant resources throughout the program. This event is being recorded and will be available from the Snow Isle Library's YouTube channel in a few days. Are you planning to add the works of Steve Olson to your personal library? Whitby Island Independent Bookstores, Kingfisher in Coopville, Moonraker in Langley, and the Book Rack and Wind and Tide Books in Oak Harbor have signed copies of Eruption available for purchase. Find a bookstore near you at bookshop.org. Steve Olson is the award-winning author of Eruption, the untold story of Mount St. Helens winner of the Washington State Book Award and named one of the best nonfiction books of 2016 by Amazon. In addition to his books, he has written for the Atlantic Monthly, Science, the Smithsonian, and many other magazines. Since 1979, he has been a consultant writer for the National Academy of Sciences, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and other national scientific organizations. A native of Washington State, he now lives in Seattle. Thank you for joining us. Now, here's Steve Olson. Thank you, Marie. I, I, I'd like to begin by saying that it has been a great honor uh, for me to have my book selected as the Woodby Reads book for 2021. You know, Woodby Island is one of my favorite places in the entire world, and I have a very specific reason uh, for that. My mom and dad met each other when they were in Everett High School, and they got married shortly after they graduated from college. And about that time, my grandparents moved from Everett to Muckleteo. They bought a house on the bluff over the train tracks, uh, looking out over Puget Sound. And one of my very first memories when I was probably three years old, is standing on that bluff and looking out over Puget Sound toward Woodby Island. Uh, one of the only pieces of artwork that my uh, parents ever bought uh, was, a, um, was an Arnie Jensen uh, uh, painting. I'm assuming that you're seeing it now of a uh, fisherman working in Puget Sound. Uh, this painting hangs in my living room now. Uh, sort of to remind us, this has always been a, a, a very famous uh, view in my family, and, um, and uh, it, it's great to have this painting to be able to remember it by. But my parents and my grandparents didn't remain in Everett. Uh, about when I was five years old, my grandma and grandpa moved to eastern Washington to become alfalfa farmers, and about a year later, my parents uh, joined them there in Othello, and as a result, I grew up in Othello, uh, Washington, uh, on the, uh, the dry side of the state. You can almost see the roof. Of, I, I think you probably could see the roof of my house uh, from looking past the water tower right here. Um, Othello is, uh, let me show you a map, uh, sort of indicate where it is. It's um, uh, you know, down uh, uh, about an hour north of the Tri-Cities, two hours south of Spokane. It's about 100 miles downwind of Mount St. Helens. So when the mountain erupted, Othello got a fair amount of ash. Here's a photograph that was taken not too long after the eruption. This shows the old 
the site of the roundhouse in Othello. Othello was the place where the Milwaukee Road uh, switched from diesel uh, locomotives that came across the, the rest of the country to electric lo locomotives to go over the passes. That was uh, Othello's claim to fame. This is a picture of the old roundhouse with the ash on there. <clears throat> but when this happened in 1980, I no longer lived in Othello. Um, so I, I missed this. I wasn't around for this ash fall. In the 1970s, I went east for college and I met the woman who would become my wife in the back of an English class, although I was a, I was a science major, but I was interested in English by that time. And in the year 1980, I was, um, I was living in Washington, DC and getting ready uh, for my wedding, which took place three weeks after the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And at this point, uh, all of my relatives, my brothers and sisters and grandparents still lived in Eastern Washington. And they, um, uh, here's, here's a picture of us at, at the, here's a picture of my wife and I at the wedding. Uh, they all came back to Mount St. Helens and they, um, a lot of them brought uh, ash that they had scraped off their driveways and off their roofs. I actually still have my my brother's bottle of ash that he got from the driveway of his house in Spokane. He was uh, living in Spokane at the time. So I can still open this bottle and the, the smell just reminds me of all the events associated with Mount St. Helens. And you know, uh, as I write in the book, I, I always thought it was a really good thing that I didn't live in Washington state when Mount St. Helens was, uh, was acting up before the big eruption, because I was exactly the type of kid, you know, interested in science, kind of a, a geeky kid interested in geology. I definitely would have said to my brother, come on, we've got to go down and see this volcano. Remember the way that it worked is Mount St. Helens started having relatively small eruptions in light of what came later, about two months before the big eruption. And I would certainly have told him, uh, let's let's go down there and just get as close to the volcano as we can. You know, we'll stay legal. We won't go any place that we're not supposed to go, but um, and and see if we can see one of these eruptions. And if I had done that on the evening of May seventeenth, I would not be here uh, talking with you today. So I lived in Washington D.C. for about thirty years, and I moved back to here to Seattle uh, when my wife got a job here about twelve years ago. And at that point, I'd written some books. Uh, and uh, when I moved back to Washington State, I said to myself, you know, I should really write some books about this state that I grew up in, uh, because um, I really took it for granted when I was growing up. And there are so many wonderful and interesting things about this state that I just didn't appreciate when I was a kid. So I said, well, obviously, the most dramatic thing that's ever happened in Washington State is the eruption of Mount St. Helens. So, uh, but, but of course, I knew at that point that other books had been written about the eruption. So I, I got those books out of the library and read through those books and, and bought some of those books and, um, and asked myself whether there was anything else that could be said about the eruption. And uh, what I discovered is that most of the books that had been written about the eruption were sort of about the geology of the mountain and um, the grandeur of volcanoes. Uh, but I very quickly got interested in, um, in something else. Because I was, um, I always felt that I would, could have been among the 57 people who was watching the eruption the day of the eruption. I got interested in these 57 people who were killed in the eruption. Um, uh, you know, here in the Northwest, we sort of tend to believe that these people were somehow responsible for their own deaths, that they were inside the danger zone or that they were where they shouldn't have been otherwise. But I, that wasn't true. I very quickly discovered only three of the 57 people who were killed by the eruption were inside the danger zone. And in fact, the one person who was really broke the law the most um, was the person that the people remember the most from the eruption, which is Harry Truman uh, shown here. These are drawings done by my daughter actually. Uh, who's in his lodge on Spirit Lake, uh, about four miles away from the, the summit. So that's what the question I set out to answer in this book. I said, why were these 57 people so close to what was obviously such a dangerous volcano? Were the danger zones too small? Or was the eruption that much bigger than people that were, were expected? Um, that's, the, that's the question that I wanted to find out. But in the process of doing this, I started to come across all of these other connections to Washington State's history. And, and that's why the first half of the book, for those of you who read it, has so much about the, the history of, the, of this state and some things that may at first seem rather tangential to, um, 
the eruption of the Mount St. Helens volcano. Uh, a lot of the story had to do with Weyerhaeuser. This is a picture of the largest log that Weyerhaeuser ever cut down, which was in a valley uh, just a few miles northwest of uh, Mount St. Helens. Uh, it turned out that the story of these 57 people was connected to that. Uh, it turned out that it was connected to the building of the railroads in Washington state and uh, by extension uh, across uh, the entire United States at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So that's why I called this book The Untold Story of Mount St. Helens. This, you know, aspects of Mount St. Helens eruption had been told before, but I wanted to look at in a little more detail at some of the deep history that led to some of the events that occurred on that Sunday morning of May 18th, 1980. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history and uh, then we're gonna take a break and we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna ask some questions and uh, maybe we'll hear about some of your stories uh, from the chat box and um, th then we'll talk about the eruption itself. So the story starts here in Rock Island, Illinois, which is a town on the Mississippi River about 150 miles west of Chicago. In the year 1856, a 16-year-old German immigrant named Frederick Weyerhaeuser moved to Rock Island, and he got a job at a lumber yard. His, was, his job was tending the boiler. He was the, the night watchman for the boiler. He'd worked at a brewery and at a railroad, but um, something really clicked at this, at this lumber yard. Weyerhaeuser turned out to be just an incredibly gifted businessman. He was intelligent, friendly, honest. Everyone trusted him. Uh, when this lumber yard went broke a couple of years after he started working at it, he and his brother-in-law sort of sold everything that they had and, and managed to buy the, 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 the lumber yard from bankruptcy, and they had began to expand it. So at first, Weyerhaeuser and his brother-in-law did what other lumbermen on the Mississippi River were doing. They bought logs that were rafted down the Mississippi River that had been cut in the forests of Wisconsin and Minnesota and put them through their sawmill. This is actually a picture. Weyerhaeuser's uh, sawmill is on the left bank of the Columbia River here in the distance where that bridge is, it covers a huge expanse of the riverfront. But Weyerhaeuser was such a good businessman that he quickly realized that the real money lay in buying land and, or, or buying stumpage, the right to cut down trees on a, on a given piece of land, and uh, hiring the crews and sort of having a vertically oriented corporation. This was the beginning of when corporations were starting to take form of, of these large vertically oriented companies in the United States. And so if he could control all aspects of the operation from the cutting of trees to the selling of timber, uh, he knew he could grow a, a, a very large business. And that's just exactly what he did. He used to, he, he began to buy these stands of this beautiful white uh, pine, virgin white pine in the Chippewa River in Wisconsin. And then he would use the money he made to buy more land. I mean, it was a perfect time to own a lumber yard. The United States was expanding into the plains. People out there needed wood to partly to build railroads, but as well to uh, build homes and, uh, and businesses. Uh, within a, just a few years, Weyerhaeuser and his brother-in-law and this lumber yard were the largest lumber yard on the Mississippi River. So in 1891, uh, Weyerhaeuser moved his family, including his seven children, from Rock Island to St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, to be near to the center of his logging operations. And he moved in next door to this man. This man is a, is a, is a very famous person in the history of Washington State. Uh, Jim Hill, another incredible businessman, another immigrant. He was from Canada, also immigrated to the United States when he was 16, the same age as Weyerhaeuser. <clears throat> um, both of them had an eighth grade education, but just had an intuitive sense of how business worked. Uh, Jim Hill, uh, who built the Great Northern Railway, uh, which extends from Duluth to, um, to Seattle, uh, built that in 1893. Um, was uh, one of the uh, great uh, uh, railroad uh, barons of the 19th century. And Weyerhaeuser bought a house that was right next to Jim Hill's house. I'm pretty sure I have, yeah, here's a picture of Jim Hill's house. It's on Summit Avenue in St. Paul. This house is still there. You have to make reservations to go see it. But if any of you ever go to St. Paul, I highly recommend that you go see this house. It is just an incredible place. Weyerhaeuser lived right next door to this house. And uh, the two men instantly, because of their similar backgrounds and interests, became fast friends. They used to spend every evening uh, at these houses. I, I think that Garrison Keeler now lives next door to this house, but I'm not sure in the, in the old Weyerhaeuser house. Uh, 
So about seven years after Weyerhaeuser moved there, uh, Jim Hill faced a major problem. He needed money to be able to buy the rail line that goes from Chicago to Burlington, Iowa. And you know, I didn't know this when I was writing the book, but that's why it's called the Burlington Northern. I, I always thought, what does Burlington Northern have to do with Burlington, Vermont? But it's not Burlington, Vermont, it's Burlington, Iowa is where that name comes from. But when Hill wanted to buy that railroad to add to his empire, um, he didn't have enough money. He didn't have money, but, well, but oddly enough, what he had was trees because by that time Hill had come to control not only the Great Northern Railway, but the Northern Pacific Railway, which um, goes from uh, uh, Minnesota essentially to Portland and then uh, up the coast. Now, the Northern Pacific Railway was one of the land grab railroads. Uh, in, the, in the 1860s, the federal government said to uh, businessmen in the United States, if you will build a railroad between uh, the Midwest and the Western United States, uh, we will give you, in compensation for building that railroad, every other section, so every other square mile of land uh, on either side of the rail lines that you build. And we'll extend that every other section of land out 20 miles in the states and 40 miles in the territories. And in this way, by building this railroad in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, uh, the Northern Pacific um, was granted 40 million acres of land for the construction of this railroad. I mean, that's more land, that's, that's the size of, larger than the size of Florida or larger than the size of New York. That's how much land that they got. One of the very first rail lines that the Northern Pacific built as they were doing this is the line in Washington State. Of, you know, they sort of built the very end of the rail line before they built the part that goes between the north Northwest. And it was the line that goes from Kalama on the, on the Columbia River up to Tacoma. This line was completed in the 1870s, right before the big depression of 1873. And in, uh, as payment for building that line, the uh, Northern Pacific received every other section of land on either side of that rail line extending out 40 miles because at this point, though Oregon was a state, Washington was still a territory. So um, they got all the land that goes out uh, from, uh, this is the rail line that goes up next to I-5 now. Now, when this rail line was built, cars hadn't even been invented. Uh, the rail line was there far before any kind, any sense of, of automobiles. Uh, but um, but anyway, uh, the Northern Pacific came to, came to uh, own all this land in Washington state. Actually, the Northern Pacific owned a huge amount of land because of some of the other, they also built this, this uh, the line that goes through Stampede Tunnel and received land grants on either side of that line as well. So on January 3rd, in the year 1900, Weyerhaeuser and Hill announced one of the largest deals in US history. Uh, Weyerhaeuser bought for $6 an acre and his business partners, he had partners in this as well. They bought uh, 900,000 acres of timberland in southwestern Washington state. And then they started building up the land that was in between these sections that the railroad owned until they uh, came to control uh, a, a, a large amount of land in Washington state. This shows the land uh, that is, is now owned uh, by Weyerhaeuser in Washington state. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, Mount St. Helens is about 35 miles to the east of I-5. The land grants extended out 40 miles to I-5. Uh, Weyerhaeuser was, of course, only interested in buying the sections of uh, land that had trees on them, so he wasn't interested in buying the land on, on Mount St. Helens. But that's why when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, the top of the volcano was owned by the railroad. It was their land that uh, was uh, blown into the atmosphere and spread around the world. Uh, and it's because of these land grants from the construction of the rail line uh, between Kalama and Tacoma in 1870s. By the way, uh, this is, uh, I calculate in the book that this is one of the greatest investments that anyone has ever made uh, after correcting for inflation. My estimate is that Weyerhaeuser and his associates earned uh, about uh, $250 for every dollar that they spent in buying up this land. Okay, so that brings us up to the year 1980. On March 20th of that year, seismic detectors in Washington state picked up this 
magnitude uh, 4.2 earthquake between Mount St. Helens. So, you know, we get lots of earthquakes here in Washington State. There was one in North Bend just the other day, a 2.5 or something like that. But usually we just have a single earthquake and then nothing happens after that. But in the case of Mount St. Helens, after this initial earthquake on March 20th, 1980, more and more earthquakes started happening. This is a, a combined seismogram of all the different earthquakes. Each one of these little squiggles is an earthquake that was happening uh, under Mount St. Helens. Essentially, it became impossible to distinguish one earthquake from the other after this. Uh, at this point, geologists were confident that magma is moving around under Mount St. Helens, but nothing had happened to the, to the volcano itself. But then about a week later, a week after that very first eruption, a uh, traffic reporter, I think, was flying a plane over Mount St. Helens, and uh, there was a loud boom that was heard at the, in the surrounding area, and this crater opened up on the top of Mount St. Helens. And these small eruptions started uh, happening from this, uh, from this crater. I mean, at, at the time, we thought these were fairly large eruptions. These were being covered extensively, by the way. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, but reading about these eruptions all the time. Uh, of course, uh, subsequently, we would realize that these were, were relatively, relatively small eruptions compared to what was going to happen. So this really became a national sensation. As I say, we were reading about it in Washington, D.C. It was covered extensively elsewhere. No volcano had erupted in the Cascades uh, since uh, Lassen Peak in Northern California in 1917, and very few people had seen that eruption at the time. So if, if for people who are around in 1980, you can maybe remember that this was just a national sensation. People came from all, I mean, people came from all over the world, not just all over the country, uh, to, see, uh, to, to see if they could drive close to the volcano, close enough to see one of these eruptions from Mount St. Helens. So law enforcement needed some way to control access to the mountain because they didn't want people driving all the way up to Mount St. Helens uh, with these eruptions going on. So the first thing that they started to do is they, they erected these roadblocks on the Spirit Lake Highway and other roads that lead up to Mount St. Helens and uh, people weren't allowed to go past the roadblock. What happened with these roadblocks is that everybody who had homes or cabins or businesses right on the other side of the roadblock where they were not allowed to go would exert pressure on local politicians, the local policymakers who were deciding where the roadblocks should go and saying, you know, the, the mountain hasn't been doing all that much lately. Why don't you move the roadblock? These roadblocks had a tendency to move up and down the Spirit Lake Highway and up and down the other highways. They, they moved all the time, sort of according to pressure, because then the geologists would say, no, the roadblock is getting much too close. You're really going to have to, um, to move it back farther away. But you know, after a little while, the roadblocks around Mount St. Helens really didn't matter all that much. They existed, but people had a, a, a very different way of accessing the mountain. By the year 1980, this, by the way, is an incredible photograph, appears in my book, and the whole story of my book is sort of contained within the, the, uh, the, 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 this parts of the photograph. By 1980, Weyerhaeuser had been logging all of the land between I-5 and Mount St. Helens for 80 years, and they had cut down almost all of the old growth forests around Mount St. Helens. In fact, the spring of 1980 happened to be the time when Weyerhaeuser was very interested in logging the last of the old growth forests that it owned, putting it through the, putting the, the lumber through the mills that could actually handle those big gigantic trees that they were cutting down. And then they were gonna shut down those mills and just become a tree farm, which is really essentially what happened after the year 1980. I mean, during the time of the eruption, during the weekdays, there were hundreds of loggers who were working in this area right around Mount St. Helens, building roads, logging and getting those logs out to the lumber mills. So by that time, Weyerhaeuser had literally built thousands of logging roads. And you can see the logging roads in this photograph. So if someone wanted to get close to Mount St. Helens, what they would do is uh, drive down I-5, drive up I-5, turn off on the Spirit Lake Highway, go a little ways up there. And then uh, you could buy a map from a gas station, which would show you these logging roads. People would drive out on these logging roads and set up as close as they could to the volcano uh, without breaking the law. Uh, to be able to see if they could see one of these uh, little eruptions uh, coming along the way. They would set up on these ridge lines. If you can see my cursor, these are important ridge lines for the story, as I'll tell you in a minute. So law enforcement needed a different way of controlling access to Mount St. Helens. And in April, this is what they did. A, a committee made of both public sector and private sector representatives sat down and took a map of Mount St. Helens and started drawing lines around it. 
And the first line they drew is the one shown in solid in the solid line here. They started here on the north side of Mount St. Helens and they drew a line across the first ridge line. It's actually this ridge line right here. They drew a line across that and they said, well, if Mount St. Helens erupts, nothing is going to get over this ridge line. So we'll be safe if we draw this line there. And, th and this line continues on the ridge line, sort of around to the north, around Spirit Lake, continues the ridge along here. Uh, it was a it, it, uh, on the south side, they were a little less worried about the south side. So um, this line just sort of follows some of the roads that exist there today. And inside this line, they called this the red zone. <clears throat> and inside the red zone, only scientists and law enforcement personnel could go. But there was a problem here uh, on, on the red zone, which is that where this line shows right here, see this kind of funny notch that was taken out of the red zone. Uh, essentially, this is the dividing line between Weyerhaeuser property, which is here to the west, where people, where hundreds of loggers were cutting logs every weekday, and then this was the, the Gifford Pinchot National Forest over here. They just, they didn't want to interrupt the logging out here because it would have disrupted a large commercial operation, <clears throat> even though the, the, there was, uh, they were not sure what Mount St. Helens was going to do. That was a complication. I'll explain in a minute about that. But so anyway, they just drew the red zone right down this line and said uh, nobody could go inside this line. Now there's another line here. You see this blue zone, this dotted line. It's called the blue zone. Uh, this extends farther away from the volcano. People were allowed to go in this area, though they had to sign a waiver saying uh, that they knew the risks that they were taking by doing so. But you'll notice here on the north west side of the volcano, there is no blue zone really. The blue zone coincides with the with the red zone. And again, that's because uh, Weyerhaeuser was logging all this land out here. And uh, <clears throat> this committee decided that they that the risk from Mount St. Helens was not great enough to interrupt the logging that was occurring. However, in April, something else happened, which is that the side of Mount St. Helens began to expand. And it began to expand exactly where the red zone and the blue zone were closest to the volcano. I should point out that this is this is only about three and a half miles from Mount Saint, from the peak of Mount St. Helens to the to the beginning of this private property out here. So it, this this really was very close. This feature of expansion, uh, geologists called the bulge, and essentially they knew that lava was moving into the interior of Mount St. Helens and starting to push out the side of the volcano. This thing would grow, some days it grew by three or four or five feet per day. This eventually extended 400 feet out from its original elevation of the volcano. I think I might have another picture. Yeah, here's another picture of the bulge taken from the old Timberline parking lot on Mount St. Helens. Here's a geologist, he's measuring the bulge. He has an umbrella out uh, because he wants to uh, keep the, the sun off of his instrument. He's measuring the growth of the bulge. You can see this just gigantic feature right here. Now, geologists were aware that some volcanoes had, had done this in the past, but they did not really understand at the time, they know much more now, about how these, how these features would behave. They knew that if there was an avalanche, this thing would come cascading down the mountain and this geologist would be dead in about a minute if that had happened. And these geologists were warned and they eventually moved away from the site because of those warnings. But they didn't really know what else to expect from this bulge. And um, so it was, um, it was just coincidental that the bulge happened to be on the side where the danger zones were the closest. Okay, so now we've gotten up to the weekend of May 17th and May 18th. May 17th is a Saturday and May 18th is a Sunday. My wife and I were talking this morning and I was saying, um, yeah, we wanted to, we want to go outside uh, because we've sort of been inside. And I say, you know, Almost every year in Washington State, there's some really good weather that happens around the third week of May. If you, if you pay attention to it, you'll see that that happened. And 1980 was one of those years in which that happened. So about the middle of the week before this particular weekend, people got the weather forecast that it was going to be a nice weekend. And it had been a really wet and rainy spring, and people had really been cooped up. So a lot of people said, we're going to get into the country and go to some of the places where we're used to going, uh, even if those places are relatively close to the volcano. So what I've shown on this map are the locations of the people who were camping out in the northwest sector of Mount St. Helens 
the part that was closest to the bulge, on the evening of Saturday, May 17th. And let me just describe some of these people. Some of these names will be familiar to them, some won't. Uh, here you see the red zone and the blue zone lines uh, along here. Here's Harry Truman, the owner of the, uh, um, uh, of the lodge. On, here's a picture of Harry um, sitting on his deck uh, at his lodge. This is a bit of a deceptive photo in that uh, Mount St. Helens is really, if you, if you were actually standing at this location, it would look much closer. It's only about three, four miles away from where he is. It's just a, a feature of the lens that sort of makes it look farther away. He's holding out in his lodge here, refusing to leave, despite the fact that everybody else uh, in this area had been evacuated. There were two people. Um, there's a, an old uh, homestead area down here, about a mile and a half down the Toodle River from Spirit Lake. And there are about 80 cabins down here. And all those cabins were in the red zone. Uh, people from them had all been evacuated. But two people, Bob Kesswetter and Beverly Weatherall, had gotten permission from the scientists to stay at their cabin on the weekends. They said that they were doing this photographic study where they would take time-lapse photographs of, of Mount St. Helens. They were, um, Bob had a little bit of, um, of uh, scientific background. Uh, many of the other people who had cabins thought that it was a bit of a ruse to get to be able, still be able to spend time in their cabins. But nevertheless, uh, they had come up to their cabins on Saturday night and they were there. Dave Johnson is here on the first ridge to the north of Mount St. Helens. This is about five miles away from the volcano. Here's that iconic picture of Dave Johnson taken on this Saturday uh, before the volcano erupted. You know, Dave Johnson had never uh, been to uh, this site before this weekend. He had, the USGS had hired a graduate student named Harry Glicken to live in this, uh, in this mobile home up on this ridge. It uh, was in a warehouser clear cut so that they could see the volcano from where they were. And Harry's job was to monitor the volcano, to keep an eye on it. And uh, if anything happened with the volcano, to issue in a warning so that uh, it could be communicated to communities downstream uh, to, to make sure that they uh, had notification that the, that the volcano had, uh, had had a larger eruption. However, that weekend, Harry Clickton had to go to uh, California to talk about his graduate program, and Dave Johnston volunteered to take his place Saturday night uh, up there on uh, what we now call Johnston Ridge. The name of the camp was Coldwater Two Camp, right here, and that's where he was. Some friends of his came up there, and uh, one of his friends was taking this photograph, uh, and they, they said, you know, it's such a beautiful day. We have our sleeping bags. Uh, why don't we just stay up here tonight with you uh, and watch the sunrise come up tomorrow morning? And Dave Johnson said, no, no, it's much too dangerous and made Harry Glicken and his two friends uh, drive back down out of the volcano so that only he would be up there by himself. Let's see, uh, Jerry Martin um, is, was one of a group of uh, ham radio, uh, amateur ham radio operators. Uh, Washington State didn't have enough money to monitor the volcano, to send a team down to monitor the volcano in real time. So a group of volunteers were doing it and Jerry Martin happened to be the volunteer who was closest to Mount St. Helens that day. He had driven his motor home up on the second to the second ridge to the north of Mount St. Helens. He was up above Dave Johnson. He could see Dave Johnson from his ridge uh, and he was watching the volcano from up there. He, he had his motor home up there on Saturday night. Reed Blackburn, a photographer for the Columbia newspaper uh, in Vancouver. He uh, had been freelancing as well for the National Geographic, and uh, he too was uh, taking a series of photographs of the volcano from this location, which is about seven miles to the northwest of Mount St. Helens. <clears throat> uh, actually, because the volcano had sort of quieted down right before this, uh, Reed Blackburn was, was just about to give up this project, but it was such a nice weekend, he decided he would stay up there for one more weekend and take what photographs he could. I write quite a bit in my book about John Killian and Christy Killian, uh, two people, a husband and wife. They live in the town of Vader, um, town similar to Othello in some ways, and I was very interested in it. They were camping here at Fond Lake, someplace where members of their family had camped for a long time. John was a warehouser for logger, he, uh, a logger for warehouser, I'm sorry. He was um, one of those hundreds of loggers that was working right around Mount St. Helens on the weekdays, and he had come back up there on Saturday to go camping with his wife, Christy. She ran a forklift at a uh, lumberyard down on the Tootle River. Uh, they were camped at the outlet to, to this lake, Fawn Lake. Um, this is now a private property. They were camped right here at the outlet. I 
I went in here to get this photograph. I mean, you can't even see Mount St. Helens from where they were camped. They were really not there to view Mount St. Helens. It was simply a beautiful weekend and they had decided to get away for the weekend. Here's a, a, some people, um, a, the, all these groups up here are camping on the Green River. The Green River is a very deep river valley about 10 miles or 11 miles to the north of Mount St. Helens. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the Moore family, Mike and Lou and their daughters, Bonnie and Tara, a little bit later in the talk. Uh, Clyde Croft and Al Handy were two friends. They'd uh, come down on Saturday and, and, rid, and ridden their horses actually up on this ridge. They were camped by an old mine here on the Green River. Um, these are six kids. I realized in retrospect, they're just exactly the age that I would have been this time. Six kids from Kelso and Longview who had driven up the Green River uh, and had parked at the trailhead, which is about here, camped, uh, hiked about a mile up the trailhead to their, their first campground and were set up here for the weekend. They were, you know, they had steaks and beer and um, <clears throat> corn on the cob, just the kinds of things that uh, we always used to do when we were kids as well. Okay, so we've talked now about everything leading up to the eruption itself. And um, now uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a break and uh, I hope hear from some of you about what might've happened to you in the 1980s. Or if you have any questions about the first part of the talk, uh, I'm happy to ask them now, any, any comments about it. So, um, so I think Marie's gonna come back on and maybe direct some of those questions and comments to me. Yeah, I'm here. Um, we do have, uh, we don't have any questions yet, but we do oh. have several stories. Oh, I'd love to hear uh, So let's go ahead and uh, we'll, we're going to start with one from Melody. Uh, she says, uh, I really enjoyed eruption. I was in Bothell visiting my parents' home and woke up by hearing a loud boom. I thought it was a can exploding in my dad's burn barrel. Yeah, you know, I, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. I've talked to a lot of people, of course, as I go, have gone around and talked to this book. And uh, this is another thing that has special relevance for Woodby Island, which is that there's a line that extended through east-west, through north Seattle, and nobody south of that line heard the eruption of Mount St. Helens. But a lot of people to the north of that line heard it. And so that would have included all of Woodby Island. And it had to do with the way that the sound of the eruption went up into the atmosphere and bounced off layers in the atmosphere and back down to the earth. And so a lot of people north of Seattle, and I bet a lot of people on Woodby Island heard the volcano erupt at 832, or as long as it takes sound to go up in the atmosphere and bounce back down to the ground uh, that morning of Sunday. So I, I'd be curious if, if anyone remembers the sound that they might've heard that Sunday morning. Uh, if, if you wanna put it in the, in the comments in the chat, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. That's interesting. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Lori says, uh, I was a 24 year old living in Vancouver, Washington at the time. My roommate, who was already at work, called to let us know the mountain had erupted. I went outside and took a picture from Cascade Park. We had to wear masks afterwards and fashion pantyhose on our air filters on our cars. I was able to fly around the mountain on a two-seater plane before the following October, one week before it erupted again. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about somebody else who was flying in a small plane right as the eruption was happening. It's an amazing story. Two mice. Uh, wrong clicking. <laughs> yeah. uh, the next story is from Anne. She says, I was on Whidbey Island the morning of the eruption. We heard a strange noise, but did not know what it was until later. I don't recall any ash. Eruption is a great book. Really good research. Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, well, the research was fun, of course. It was an excuse to spend two hours hanging out in Southwest Washington, talking with loggers and going on hikes. So, uh, who, who, oh, you do have to write it after that, but the research is great. So next up is Betsy. Betsy says, hi, Steve. I am currently a librarian with Snow Isle, but in 1980, I worked for the Cowlitz Library and Learning Services based out of the Longview Public Library. This was a fe federally funded jobs program that brought library services, services to the county. I supervised the bookmobile that visited many of the small communities in the county. This was seen as an essential service and Sheriff Nelson gave us a red zone pass for the bookmobile. 
it was just fate that library workers weren't working on that Sunday. I wanted to share this story to preserve this tiny bit of history. Thanks for a wonderful book. Yeah, that's the astonishing thing, of course. When I spend time in Southwest Washington State, there's a lot of people who tell me, you know, it is a miracle that this volcano erupted on a Sunday. If it had erupted on a weekday, when all of those loggers were out there, I mean, hundreds of loggers from Weyerhaeuser would have been killed. I mean, Sunday morning, there were probably fewer people around that volcano than at almost any other time. Saturday afternoon, a whole caravan of cars had been allowed by Governor Dixie Lee Ray, who's a prominent character in my book, but who I don't talk about and uh, I won't talk about today, uh, to go visit their cabins on Spirit Lake uh, just a few hours before those cabins were completely destroyed, obliterated by the eruption. So. Uh, there, there are a lot of people. It's, it's hard to believe that Weyerhaeuser would have emerged from a calamity like that intact if uh, hundreds of their, their loggers had been killed by Mount St. Helens. So this story is from Lisa. She says, we were at home in Maple Valley. My grandfather called to tell us that the mountain had erupted, so we all went down the road to a clearing so we could see. I was amazed that we could see it so far north. Yes, that summer, my wife and I uh, went uh, for our honeymoon. We got in her car, her little old Honda, and drove across the country. And we were here for some of the subsequent eruptions. And uh, I remember being in Gig Harbor and going to a high hill and watching the July eruption from there. And it was quite visible. It, was, it wasn't even a clear day in July. But remember, the volcano continued to erupt over the course of the summer and for the next few years. And many of those eruptions were visible. But none were as big as the May 18th one, of course. Next is from Deb. She says, I had just been engaged that weekend. I definitely heard the eruption. No, I wonder where she was. Yeah, I always informally gather information about where people were. Uh, and, and, you know, there were people way up in Canada who heard the eruption when the sound bounced off the atmosphere. Deb, if you want to drop that in chat, we'll update Steve later. Uh, next is from Joanne. She says, I think you made the point that Mount St. Helens was a kind of entertainment at the time, as lay people didn't feel that the several eruptions would ever amount to a great eruption. I heard the boom where we live near Deming, oh, yeah. near Bellingham. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's, a, that's an interesting and astute observation. There were people who viewed volcanoes as entertainment, and they still do. Even after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, other people, including volcanologists, were killed by getting too close to volcanoes. Now, volcanologists have reasons for going there. They want to learn more about volcanoes. But there is a lot of volcano tourism. They are incredible things to see. Uh, since writing this book, anytime I go visit a volcano anywhere in the world, I can consider it a business expense. So I, I try to do so. And the, the volcanoes are you know, among the most incredible places on Earth to see. So. Uh, it's, it's perfectly understandable to me why lots of people were coming to see Mount St. Helens. Now, I often ask myself, when I look at that bulge in these pictures and realize that you could get three and a half miles away from that volcano um, and, and not be breaking the law in 1980, I ask myself the question, and I sort of wrote the book in such a way that I hope other people would ask themselves the question, what would, what would I have done? Would I have gotten that close to the volcano or not? So a uh, follow up from Deb, she says she was nine miles northeast of Bellingham. Wow. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's Our pretty way. cool. Mm -hmm. Janet says, I know someone in Bellevue who heard the eruption and another person in Eugene who heard it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that doesn't surprise me at all. You know, these were in the 1980s for people who didn't live through them. There was a very different time as far as communications. Most people did not know about the eruption until they went to church or they heard it you know in the afternoon i mean it wasn't like today where the news just would have gone out instantly lots of people in eastern washington i'm not going to talk about the the coming of the ash cloud to eastern washington i mentioned it briefly at the beginning of this talk but they didn't know about the eruption of the volcano until the ash cloud was you know coming in their direction and and word passed mouth to mouth what, what is that everyone thought it was a thunderstorm and finally, they realized that no Mount St. Helens had erupted and the ash was headed their way. Vern says uh, that in Green Bank, we thought our kids had knocked over a piece of furniture upstairs. <laughs> yeah, I've heard things like that. <laughs> 
Andrea's story is that her former husband and she were at Long Acres. Uh, she can't remember if they won any money. Um, she did have a couple of jars of ash, but they've disappeared. She remembers it was a dim and eerie day. Yeah, it's been, you know, and, uh, even more so downwind, of course. But yes, there were places to the north. Uh, maybe, you know, the ash cloud didn't get all the way up here, but places like uh, Randall and Morton, they were in the ash cloud. And if you got gained any elevation that day, you could look down toward Mount St. Helens. Uh, I, I might recommend another book called Path of Destruction by the geologist Richard Waite. And uh, for those of you who are really interested in the details of Mount St. Helens, I always say, if you're going to read uh, two books about Mount St. Helens, read mine first, but then read Richard's because he's a geologist who spent 30 years of his life gathering eyewitness accounts of the people around Mount St. Helens, including people, for instance, on commercial jetliners that were flying over Mount St. Helens, whose pilots decided that they would take a couple of passes to see what was going on down on the ground. And it is, it is an incredible amount of really fascinating information about what happened that day. Diane says, I was at church in Everett in the basement reading, leading a teacher's meeting. We heard the boom, but it sounded like kids running upstairs. <laughs> Went upstairs and there was no one there. Looking forward to reading the book. Oh, good. Steve, um, you are muted. I wonder why that happened. I don't know. Yeah, okay, um, well. Uh, but you are unmuted now, so uh, did you want to say something about um, Diane's story? No, I don't know exactly oh. where somebody muted me, but uh, yeah, perhaps inadvertently. Um, what I was saying is that Mount St. Helens is one of those historical episodes that people remember where they were when they heard of it. Okay, that is so true. I definitely remember. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell my story. Um, I was I was asleep. Uh, it was Sunday, and I was a teenager. I was asleep. And, uh, my sister and I shared a room, and uh, it woke us from a sound sleep. And when you're a teenager, that's pretty significant. And and uh, you know we were in Cedra Woolley, so it was quite far mm -hmm. north. So uh, next official story is from Anne, who says, I was in high school in Bothell and stayed overnight at a friend's house. We slept in their travel trailer. Sunday morning, one friend left early. And shortly after that, we heard a noise. It's that we thought was my friend's mother slamming a door. My mom let me know when she came to pick me up that the mountain had erupted. Over the next few weeks, we occasionally had a light dusting of ash on our cars. Yeah, you know, it would have been so interesting to have. Have I ever heard a recording of that sound that somebody might have had a microphone on? I'm going to have to spend some time on the web now and see if somebody actually managed to get a recording that Sunday morning. That would really be interesting. This next story is from SK. I was in eighth grade living in Great Falls Mountain. I guess that's Mountain. Uh, the ash reached us. Montana. Ah, uh, Montana, thank you. Uh, the ash reached us, and it was the only time I can recall that school was ever canceled. Never for snow, but for, for volcanic ash, it did. The book was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, my brother was going to school at uh, in Washington State, uh, and uh, he in the book I tell the stories of what they did. And my other brother was in Spokane. My my grandma was still in, in Othello, so I got all kinds of accounts of the ash. Uh, told to me in person at my wedding three weeks later. Oh, I bet you wish sort of you hadn't missed that. But I guess the wedding was probably pretty cool. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was good. But I, I, I do wish I'd been around. It would have been interesting to be here. So Monica says, I was in a cabin with a group of friends in Oso in the Stillaguamish River, on the Stillaguamish River. We were sleeping on the floor when we woke up from a sound sleep to what sounded like a bulldozer trying to tear down our cabin. This happened two times. It was extremely loud. Yes, I've heard some of those reports that there were two or three sounds. Some people just heard one, but others heard a series of them. 
And that might have been the sound bouncing off different layers in the atmosphere back down to the Earth. There have been really interesting academic papers written about this, uh, depending in part on the reports of people that they've gathered from around the Northwest. Melody says, um, also my brother Randy and his young family lived in Longview and schools closed for the year. That summer myself and my three Pyongyang children went down to visit them. We saw the trees covered in wet ash six feet up. Also the golf course was covered in ash and Melody apologies if I've mispronounced um, Pyongyang. On. Yeah, of course, the ash from Mount St. Helens is still a very serious problem. The sedimentation problems on the Tudor River and the Cowlitz remain very difficult. And uh, there's a, there are studies that are going on even now of how to handle that. A, a large dam was built to, hit the, to hold the sediment back on the Tudor River. That sediment dam is now full. People have to decide what to do with it. The water in Spirit Lake is still an issue of how to drain that away without causing downstream flooding. They, even now, and for the foreseeable future, the sediment from Mount St. Helens is going to be a problem. Barbara says, I was living in Kennewick, just south of Othello. Because it was such a nice day, I was working in the backyard. There was a faint boom, which I attributed to military activities in the Yakima firing range. Later, I found out the mountain had erupted. Kennewick was almost due east of Mount St. Helens, so got very little ash as the ash cloud was moving more to the northeast. Yeah. We had no mail or other del deliveries for several days because the ash was still in the surrounding area areas, and thus aircraft, trucks, and such could not get through. Yeah, people, people were really trapped there. Okay, all these great stories is making me want to tell the story of the eruption now, so let's do it. Let's, let's get back to that day. Okay, so here we are. Actually, this photograph is taken from that, um, that Saturday, the Saturday of that weekend, May 17th. It's taken from the, uh, the clear cut on uh, what is now Johnston Ridge, five miles away from the volcano, looking toward the bulge. That's the bulge that's been covered by ash, as has much of the rest of the snow on the mountain, by these, uh, the smaller eruptions that had been occurring for the previous two months. I mentioned this small plane. There were a couple of geologists from Spokane who had come to a gem show in Yakima. And they said to themselves, you know, we've never seen Mount St. Helens. So on Saturday, they went to the local airport and uh, hired a little Cessna and a pilot to fly them around Mount St. Helens on Sunday morning. So they had flown up there Sunday morning. They were the only plane there at about this time. And they'd made these four passes around Mount St. Helens. And on one of the passes, as they were doing their fourth pass, so they're headed toward the east at this point, they said they saw this crack, this huge crack up here on the top of the mountain, extending from east to west. And essentially the whole northern side of the mountain began slipping down away. It was, much, it was a much larger sector of the mountain than the bulge. The bulge had weakened the whole north side of the mountain. And so what happened is that that north side collapsed. And as soon as that happened, this gigantic cloud, which, which is shown in this photograph here, this cloud of ash and boulders and, and super hot material just came rushing out of the volcano. Uh, geologists have a term for this. They call it a, a pyroclastic flow. But you know, a lot of them in the case of Mount St. Helens, just the black, this sudden release of energy Energy and gas uh, from, I think I have another photograph of it here. Yes, this is about a minute after the, the north face of the mountain is given away. I mean, you can see some of these, these are these, these boulders out here at the ends of these sort of vapor trails are the size of cars. This is the, uh, this is the quantity of material that's being released from this. At this point, all you're seeing here is the blast. The avalanche, which cascaded down the mountain towards Spirit Lake, was overtaken in about 30 or 40 seconds by this this huge expansion of gas, because this thing was traveling at 300, 400, maybe 500 miles an hour. So what happened down at Spirit Lake, where Harry, where Harry Truman was, and in those cabins where uh, those the two people who had stayed up there Saturday night was, is those things were hit by the blast first. And it must have just, the blast was so powerful. I've described it as like a stone hurricane, that it just must have blown everything to smithereens. And then a few seconds later, the avalanche would come and cover the remains that were there. I mean, uh, Harry Truman's Lodge is still there, but it's 200 feet down underneath 
the north side of Mount St. Helens. This is a view from the east side of Mount St. Helens taken by somebody who got away, which is how we have this film. But I sort of show this to give some indication of what it must have looked like on the ridge to the north of Mount St. Helens where David Johnston was, was watching the volcano. Given the rate that the blast was traveling, he, he had about oh, 45, 50 seconds or something like this before the blast hit him. And of course, you know, he, he, he ran, you know, he saw it, uh, he ran to the radio and he said, Vancouver, Vancouver, Washington, where the rest of the geologists is, this is it. Because he was doing his job. He was, he and Harry Glicken had been sent up there to monitor this volcano and see if it uh, did anything else. Um, <clears throat> um, if a, if, a, if a large eruption was going to occur that was going to cause any difficulties for the downstream communities. Uh, he must have watched this blast come closer and closer to him. He must have known that he was going to be unable to escape it. When this blast hit the top of the ridge on which he was sitting, it essentially scoured the ridge down to bedrock. It, it just the trees that hadn't been chopped, chopped down by Weyerhaeuser already uh, were just blown off. In fact, when you go to Johnson Ridge and you look at the stumps that are there, you'll see some that are sawed off. That's where the old clear cuts were, where David Johnson was sitting. And also see trees that have, that have been obviously snapped off by the force of the blast. I mean, it took David Johnson and that um, camper that was up there on that ridge, tossed it all into the valley to the north of Mount St. Helens and covered it up with debris so completely that we've never found hardly any traces of, um, of him or of the, of the camper. I mean, that happened to Jerry Martin too. Jerry Martin, the, the ham radio operator who was on the second ridge to the north of Mount St. Helens, his 25 foot mobile home was also blown into adjacent valley, covered up and has never been seen again. Of the 57 people killed in the eruption, um, only about half the bodies were found eventually. This is Reed, Reed Blackburn's car. Reed Blackburn was the photographer who was about seven miles to the northwest of Mount St. Helens. He actually took a couple photographs of Mount St. Helens, got back in his car in an effort to drive away, but before he could go anywhere, the, the ash cloud enveloped him, uh, blew out the windows of his car. And this is how most of the people died who died from Mount St. Helens of ash asphyxiation. Essentially, the ash would just replace the oxygen that was there. You would breathe it in. Uh, it was essentially like drowning, drowning in ash. And that's uh, what happened um, to Reed Blackburn at this site. This is a photograph of Fawn Lake, where the Killians were camping. They were camped right here at the outlet of Fawn Lake that I showed you earlier. See, here you can see Mount St. Helens. This is about, uh, I forget, nine, nine miles or so away from Mount St. Helens. This is, this is old growth timber that was knocked down by the eruption. These are, these are gigantic trees. You can see the force of the blast as it hit Fawn Lake and these other areas to the north of Mount St. Helens. You know, I won't, uh, the Killian story is inevitably a tragic one. Um, I, I spent a lot of time with the people in Vader and people who knew the Killians and uh, it, it's, gosh, it's still hard for people in that town uh, to think about this. Um, this is a picture of the Green River Valley. So I'm going I'm to conclude my description of the eruption by talking a little bit about the Green River Valley. And you remember there were several groups of people who were camped on the Green River Valley on Saturday night. There were uh, the two guys from Tacoma who were camped by the mine right down here. Um, there were the Moore families, the parents and their two daughters. Uh, they were camped sort of in the middle area here. And then Further down the Green River, or sort of around this bend right here, is where those six kids from Kelso and Longview were camped. And actually, uh, where they were camped, um, the blast was still sufficiently strong <clears throat> that it knocked down trees in this area. And two of those six kids were killed by, uh, by a falling tree, a tree that fell on their tent. But the Moors were not in that area. The Moors had actually planned to camp where those kids from Kelso were, but they got there sort of late in the day. And as they walked up the Green River Valley, they saw the kids were camping in the place where they had planned to camp and decided to keep going to the next campground. And as a result, they camped, they ended up camping in a shadow that was cast by a large mountain between them and Mount St. Helens called Black Mountain. And where they were camped, the trees did not fall down. So I, um, I didn't put any of this in the book. If you visit the visitor center, you can hear a 
a little bit more about the Moors. Uh, Mike gave me permission to show some of the some of the slides um, that he um, some of the photographs that he took. Uh, here they are. It's Sunday morning. You know, it's this beautiful morning, uh, May 18th. They are camped in the Green River Valley. By the way, uh, if anyone wants to do a little bit of hiking, this remains one of the most uh, amazing old growth, low elevation old growth forests that I have ever seen in Washington State, because these these huge trees where they were camping were preserved from the blast by the shadowing effect of Black Mountain and are still standing today. So you can go down to this area and see some of these trees. So here's Lou and Bonnie, they're getting breakfast ready and about 8.30, they hear this sound to the south of them. And Mike run, runs out, Mike had this, this good camera, runs out into a open area and realizes that Mount St. Helens is, uh, has erupted. He has a, a geology background himself. But he says to himself, well, you know, we're 12 miles to the north of Mount St. Helens. So it's not as if anything could possibly happen to us here. But as he watches, this cloud gets closer and closer, and he continues to take these photographs. You know, because of the cameras and video equipment that was available in 1980, we don't really have very good pictures. But he said this cloud was just full of lightning, and it was, and it had every kind of color that you could possibly imagine. He said it was like the most beautiful thing that he'd ever seen. But this cloud did overtake them on the Green River. So here's what they did. They had camped by this old this, this shed, this hunting shed that was that was right on the Green River. And they, they took their tent and they took the girls and they took their packs and they threw them all into that tent uh, before the ash cloud reached, uh, I mean, th they threw them all into the shed before the ash cloud reached them. And they said for two hours, the ash was so thick that they could not see any Thing inside the shed, but that the thunder from the lightning was so loud that they couldn't even talk to each other, so loud and so continuous that they couldn't even talk to each other for two hours because uh, the, 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 any, any sound that they made would be drowned out by the thunder. They didn't see any light at all. The ash was too dark to let the, the light from the lightning in, but the thunder was just absolutely nifting. But evidently, uh, but, you know, eventually that Sunday morning, the ash cloud cleared. Here's Mike and, and Bonnie. Uh, they've, they've emerged from the shed and they've looked around. The trees are still standing. There's ash all over everything, but evidently the ash wasn't too terribly hot. It was, it was hot elsewhere, but it wasn't, wasn't too bad here. Uh, they realized that uh, they didn't have any choice. They were just going to have to pack up their stuff and head back to their car. So that's what they did that Sunday Sunday by midday after the ash cloud had gone. So they started hiking back down the Green River and they began to come across trees that had fallen across the trail. And they said, well, that's funny because when we hiked up here yesterday, this tree hadn't fallen across the trail. They realized that, uh, of course, these <clears throat> trees have been blown over by the volcano. But they make their way around these trees, not an easy thing to do with those gigantic old growth trees. They come around a corner and, and they see an entire forest that has been blown down in front of them. And there's absolutely no way that they're gonna be able to make their way across this forest to where their car is parked farther down the Green River. So by this time it's getting to be Sunday evening and uh, you know they realized there was nothing they could do. They were just gonna to have to spend another night in the woods. So they're good campers. They had their 10 essentials, they had extra food. They set up their uh, tent and, uh, on the ash. Uh, and, uh, and Mike says they slept pretty well that night actually, that um, they got a good night's sleep. Uh, got up the next morning and uh, thought that they were gonna have to try somehow to make their way over all of these down trees. But Lou had been wearing this orange fleece and there were helicopters that were doing rescue missions in Mount St. Helens, uh, around Mount St. Helens. The Moors were the last family that were rescued around Mount St. Helens. And the helicopter pilots said that they could see, they could, they could see this orange color down around the, uh, um, down in the Green River Valley and knew that there was somebody down there. But a lot of the rescue missions were flying these gigantic Hueys, and there was no way that they could get a Huey that was going to be able to come down and, and pick up the moors. So I don't think I wrote about this too much in the book, but um, I'll show you that photo in just a second. Um, they contacted a, a very famous helicopter pilot named Jess Hagerman. I don't think I talk about Jess in the book, but Jess basically has more or less spent his uh, adult life uh, flying helicopters. He flew for warehouses, really flown for almost everybody. And he was flying in a small little helicopter. And uh, the, the, one of the Hueys dropped one of these guys on a cable and he, they had one of the uh, pararescue uh, helpers and they were able to get the moors down to the Green River. 
And Jess was able to take this little small helicopter and hover, just get, he got one skid down on a gravel bank in the Green River and, and told the Morris to get into this tiny little helicopter as he's hovering there. And you know, one of the problems with the Hueys was that as they got lower, they would suck up the ash and nobody could see anything. And that was happening with this helicopter. There's ash everywhere, it's flying, it's noisy. He doesn't know if he can keep this helicopter there. And the Moors are getting in and Mike gets in and Lou gets in and Bonnie gets in. And Jess Hegerman's saying to himself, wow, this is a small helicopter. I'm really gonna be overloaded. And, and Lou is carrying a backpack. And he says, he yells back at him. He says, you can't bring that backpack in here. Uh, you know, you've got to leave all that stuff behind. And Lou is yelling at him because remember, I told you there were two girls. This is the baby backpack and the little four month old Bonnie is in the baby backpack. She's screaming, there's a baby in the backpack. So <laughs> finally, Jess, uh, finally Jess can hear what she's saying. She, he says, okay, keep the baby. So uh, somehow manages to get all the moors in there. The helicopter was terribly overloaded. He was greatly concerned as he was taking off that he was, wasn't going to be able to fly straight up and he was flying on instruments, but did manage to get the moors out of there. Uh, it was, as I say, the last rescue in Mount St. Helens. Here's a little map that I drew that shows the, the fantastic extent of the size of this eruption. Uh, let me just explain a little bit about what this is showing. Here's the volcano in yellow. This is the debris flow. So this is essentially the avalanche that's coming down on the northern flanks of Mount St. Helens. It's flowing down the Tudor River here. Uh, on the south side of the volcano, these were mud flows generated by when the, the glaciers and snow on Mount St. Helens melted and carried all this mud down the river valleys and off the sides of the volcanoes. Actually, no one was killed on this side of the volcano, but there were some very close calls as these mud flows came down the river valleys. This large area in red is the blowdown zone. This is where the blast was powerful enough to knock down trees. And this is a huge area. This is 17 miles away from the center of the volcano here. I've superimposed this map on a, uh, on a map of Seattle just to give people some sense of how large this eruption was. So if the volcano was down around Seward Park here, you know, here's Bainbridge Island, uh, Shoreline, basically all of Seattle would be wiped out uh, by, by this eruption. Uh, by the way, I'd said uh, you know, that there was the shadow that was cast by Black Mountain, which is situated about here. So this is where the Moors were camped. They were in this one little shadow right here where the blast did not blow down any trees, whereas the kids from Kelso and Longview were camped here where some of the blowdown area was. I'm going to take one more second to show you where the 57 people were who were killed in the eruption. As I said at the very beginning of this talk, only three of them were in the danger zone and everyone else was outside of it. Um, all, all these people uh, were, were legally where they should have been. Uh, they, they were not breaking the law when they were there. And that's one of the, the conclusions I draw from this book is that um, here you have these events that happen in history. Uh, a lumberman moves next door to a railroad builder in the, in the 1890s and and the, the consequence of the business interaction they has has a direct and immediate impact on the lives of these people. Yeah, on a Sunday morning in the year 1980, it's just, it's astonishing the way in which history has an influence on us today. So anyway, that's the story that I wanted to tell in this book. And uh, I'm really glad that, uh, that some people have been reading it and enjoying it. So maybe we have, a, you know, it's getting a little bit late now, but if people want to stay, uh, maybe we'll see if there are any questions that have been generated or hear some more of these great stories from people. Uh, there are some questions. Oh, uh, okay. uh, the first one is from Mary. Uh, she asks, were any photos recovered from those who perished? Uh, was film recovered from their cameras? Some film was recovered from their cameras. However, in almost every case, the heat was so great that the film had been exposed. And so uh, though people have found uh, Reed Blackburn's cameras and developed his photographs, none of that sort of survived uh, from, the, from the eruption. There were a few people who did manage to get photographs after the eruption and uh, of course the, the, the people who got out. There might have been just a handful of photographs that did survive among people who died, but, but not many. The stories I really remember are about the, the film that was exposed, but then the, the heat destroyed the film. Dan uh, says he, he thought Johnston felt it was unsafe 
to be there and was asked to stand in rather than volunteering. Uh, it's his story uh, that he finds the most moving. And he wonders, are there provisions of the law now requiring zones to be identified by danger regardless of ownership? I don't think so. I don't think that law has ever been made. However, uh, um, there, there have been many changes to the way that volcanologists approach volcanoes since Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens taught them an incredible amount about how volcanoes behave and about the steps that need to be taken to keep people safe. And the steps that have been taken since the eruption of Mount St. Helens have probably saved, well, many thousands of lives in cases like the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1980 and the, uh, 1990 in the Philippines. Uh, people hadn't realized that volcanoes can behave like this, although David Johnson is really interesting. David Johnson was aware that volcanoes can do what Mount St. Helens did, which was erupt to the side, essentially, explode laterally and devastate areas on that side. He had pointed to a couple of other volcanoes that had behaved in that way. But geologists were not familiar enough with those volcanoes to know that that was a, 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 a risk of some magnitude. They have since realized that volcanoes have a tendency to do this quite a lot. And they found other geological features that are evidence of the, these sideways eruptions, these lateral eruptions. If you're driving on I-5 down toward Mount Shasta and you start coming across these hills about 20 miles away from the volcano, those were caused by lateral eruptions at Mount Shasta. But people only, geologists only realized that after they were able to observe what happened at Mount St. Helens. Now, the question of David Johnson volunteering uh, as opposed to, to um, he was aware that it was very dangerous. The USGS had taken steps at that point to send an armored personnel carrier to that position so that if the, the volcano ever erupted, the geologist who was stationed there could, could climb inside that armored personnel carrier and be more protected than they were. It was on its way to that location coming down I-5 but hadn't reached the location yet. He, he, was, he knew it was dangerous. He'd almost been killed by an eruption two years earlier. So uh, and that, and that's why he told his friends, but when he, when he said that he would fill in for Harry, uh, for Harry Glick and he said, well, it's only a night, uh, I should be okay. That's tragic. Uh, uh, Kathleen says that she was fascinated by the tidbit about Paul Kane and his amazing painting. Uh, she did a little research. Uh, she thinks it's a great topic for a future book. <laughs> also, uh, she wants to know, do you have anything to add re regarding Native peoples? Yeah, you know, I, I talk a little bit about the Native peoples and the stories that they had about Mount St. Helens. They were obviously the, the, the Native name for Mount St. Helens reflects a, a deep understanding of the behavior of that volcano over centuries and, and maybe over millennia. The, the cone of Mount St. Helens was only about 3,000 years old. The Cowlitz and the other tribes that lived in that area, they had watched that volcano grow and destroy itself and grow itself back. And uh, that behavior was reflected in their in their mythology and in the stories they told about not only Mount St. Helens, but about Mount Hood and uh, about Mount Adams as well. And uh, all, only in retrospect, perhaps, was the scientific significance of those stories appreciated. I, I, I don't give it as much time as I wish I had in that book, but uh, there's fascinating literature about it in other books and also at the David Johnson Visitor Center on the ridge where David Johnson was stationed that, uh, that Sunday morning. Do you have any records from the tree planting contracts going back to the early 70s? Uh, this person was in a planting crew for a comp yeah. company named Baxter uh, who contracted with Weyerhaeuser. And they think they were planting between the forks of the Toodle River on the southwest side. And they've often wondered if those trees survived. Uh, they planted no Noble and Douglas firs mm -hmm. uh, seven mm -hmm. years before Mount St. Helens erupted. Yeah, that Sunday morning, there was a tree planting crew on the south side of the volcano. And when the volcano erupted, the leader of that crew, which had about 14 people in it, had to make some quick decisions that had to turn out to be right if that crew was going to be okay. And, and she did. She managed to get that crew to safety. But uh, there were turns they could have made that would have uh, ended up with them being in a lot more trouble than they were. On the south side, they had a little more time to react because of uh, the because uh, there they were threatened more by the melting of the snow and the mud flows that came down off that side of the mountain. You know, there was a lot of tree planting. Weyerhaeuser, of course, does replant its forest down there; has continued to replant its forests. I don't have records from that, 
But Weyerhaeuser was sued by uh, family members of, a, uh, of the, some of the victims who had worked for Weyerhaeuser, and that uh, suit eventually did go to trial here in King County. I did have access to those records, thousands of pages of those records in the King County Courthouse, and they were really an invaluable resource for me in trying to reconstruct some parts of this story. Uh, but the records did not relate to any tree planting crews because they were not among the victims uh, of the 57 people who were killed that day, by, fortunately. Mary asks if you um, are suffering from any temptation to visit Iceland and get close to the eruption there. Uh, I'm, I'm always tempted. These, these are amazing places to see. I, I guess I haven't lost the the desire that I would have had in 1980 to get close to these uh, these geological phenomena. Uh, I, I'm a little more, you know, knowing the story, I'm a little more cautious than I might be otherwise in places like Hawaii or or Vesuvius uh, when you when you go to see some of these sites. Uh, but but they they still are um, amazing places, and you know. Um, a lot of people in Washington State have never made the trip down to see Mount St. Helens and to do things at the visitor center. I, I really encourage everyone who hasn't gone there or hasn't even gone there recently to, to go down and take a look at it. It is one of the most amazing places in the world to see what a volcano can do and the consequences of eruption. And more recently, the ways in which the, the biology of the area surrounding it has bounced back and has started to rejuvenate itself. There's a brand new book, it's up on my shelves by a guy named Eric Wagner, which is about the biologists who've been studying the, uh, the revival of life around Mount St. Helens since 1980. And it, it too is really an interesting story. Uh, before I uh, read the next question, I just wanna say that uh, there has been uh, uh, an overwhelming response to our um, uh, invitation to share stories and questions. And so uh, I apologize now if we don't get to all of them, they're all important to us. And I will make sure that I share them with you, Steve. I'm not really sure how we could manage. Uh, maybe there'll be a blog post later. We, we might have you as a guest and you can answer questions within a blog post if that's something you're interested in doing. We can talk about that later. Um, uh, Susan asks, do you know how far east the ash fell? Uh, she says they felt they, they feel like they might have seen a little in Wisconsin. Oh, I've heard from people in New York who say, you know, we saw it on our car. So it wasn't a lot of ash that got all the way to the East Coast, but there was some. And I, I, I believe them. I, I think there really was because that ash eventually rose up into the upper atmosphere. The ash cloud rose so high that it got up into the jet stream and eventually went all the way around the world. So there's some question about whether or not sunsets were enhanced for the few weeks after the eruption of Mount St. Helens who were redder than usual because of the amount of ash that was in the upper atmosphere. But certainly it was visible. You could see it on satellite that this ash had made its way all the way around the world. So sure, Wisconsin, absolutely. Um, there are scientific studies of where the ash fell, of where the ash fell, and they certainly show measurable ash fall as far as the Midwest. Next question is from Pam. She wonders where was the line below which the eruption wasn't heard? I was in Wallingford in Seattle and didn't hear it. Ah. I learned about it at the University District Street Fair later that morning. That's really valuable information. I'm really glad you read that comment because it's the only way I've been able to reconstruct this myself because I've never seen a line drawn. But I've talked to enough people now that I know that there was this line in North Seattle. And people above that line in shoreline were able to hear it. It's really interesting to me to hear that it wasn't heard in Wallingford because that means the line was somewhere between 145th Street and 45th Street. Okay, um, I think I'm going to scroll down um, and look and see if we have another couple stories. Uh, yeah, here's one from Gay. My husband and I were living in Auburn probably heard a sonic-like boom. We watched the ash plume while sitting on our rooftop. Hmm. A fine layer of ash covered our cars. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, in Auburn, which is south of Seattle. So uh, uh, that, that's interesting to hear that they could hear it there. Maybe they were close enough that they would have heard it directly, as opposed to the people who heard it when it went up to the top of the atmosphere and bounced down. Let's see, uh, Kendall asks, were there subsequent booms later on that Sunday? 
No, I don't think so. I think the only sound that was generated that was heard a distance away from the volcano was that very initial uh, the eruption, uh, the, the, the blast, the pressurized material that burst out of the volcano. And you know, the funny thing when you talk about eyewitnesses down there is that the people who were right around the volcano and who were flying around the volcano in planes and helicopters, evidently the ash muffled the sound of the volcano. So as they were watching the volcano, they said it was like watching a silent movie. They didn't hear a thing. They would hear the sound of their planes or the sound of the helicopter rotors, but they would not hear any sound coming from the volcano at all. So uh, here's an interesting uh, question. Um, I don't know who asked it. Uh, the question is, what were the first tree species to naturally colonize on the ash fallout on the shoulders of the mountain? And how long did it take these first tree colonizers to begin to grow? Now, this is a long question. Uh, what is the basic composition of the ash and how deep was the ash on the shoulder and flats? And if trees were planted on the northwest side within three to four miles of the base of the mountain, would those trees have survived? Three to four miles. Yes. It, so I'll sort of uh, take these in reverse order. The trees that were covered by still covered by snow because it was May 18th, and so the snow was high enough to cover low growing trees. Those ones did survive. And they provided a, uh, a sort of a uh, source for seeds and for animals to uh, gradually recolonize the blast zone, the areas that had been decimated by the blast. But you know, if I answered a lot of those other questions, I bet you I would get it wrong. Eric Wagner's new book describes this recolonization process. And I, I have a couple pages about it in my book. But there are other people who have looked much more closely at the ecological studies of the mountain. It is fascinating. In the same way that the study of the, what the volcano did has changed our conceptions of how volcanoes behave, the ecologists and biologists who have studied Mount St. Helens have learned a tremendous amount and it's overturned some conventional ideas about how areas that are devastated like this are repopulated by plants and animals. They really, it was just a, a sort of a revolution in their thinking that was generated by their being able to observe what happens in this controlled situation. It's one of the reasons the Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument was made was to be able to study that process. And I do describe in the book the sort of political process and economic process by which the monument was made. But those studies have been going on for 40 years and are still going on today. And in fact, there's a current controversy about building a road across through an area where some of these studies are being conducted to deal with the sedimentation problems in Spirit Lake. And people will read about that in the newspapers uh, if they're sort of tracking what's happening with Mount St. Helens these days. Kendall wonders, uh, did you interview Bonnie Lou, the only child now grown up, about her memories? You know, I did not. Some people have over the years. Hmm, this is a very interesting issue. When, when you spend a lot of time down in, in Southwest Washington, a lot of people are eager to talk to you, but the people who survive, the survivors of Mount St. Helens, they a lot of them have not had an easy time of it. And it's not so much because so much attention has been paid to them or because they've been asked these questions so many times. It's because those events were really traumatizing for them. And I think a lot of those people don't like to be asked these questions. They don't, they don't like to remember it. They, they really seem to have difficulties. I'm, I'm generalizing, but this is a, in, in talking with people who were survivors and who had managed to get away, uh, it hasn't been easy for them to think about what happened on that Sunday. And I think many of them, and, and Bonnie and, and Tara are among them, uh, would, would rather not think about it. I would like to know if you've seen the play about the dad searching for his son who was camping with his wife at Deer Lake when the eruption took place. It was a heartbreaking production at the Driftwood Theater in Edmonds. Um, she thinks it was titled Man Versus Nature. I've heard about that play, but I have not seen it, nor have I read the script. So yeah, if, if somebody has a copy and can send it to me, you can just get to me through my website. I'd be very interested in seeing it because I do not have a copy of that script and would love to see it. I'm gonna go back to some stories now. Anne says, I was a directory assistance telephone operator in Seattle 
working the Sunday morning shift. Just after 8 a.m., we began getting hundreds of calls asking for emergency numbers. I heard bits of conversations as I looked the numbers up so I knew what was happening. Eventually, there was a call from a terrified Eastern Washington woman who frantically asked if the world had ended. She awoke to get ready for church, and from her perspective, the sun had not risen. I explained what was going on, trying to calm her down. There were many urgent calls. It was a memorable day. Oh, it seemed like that in Eastern Washington. You saw this cloud approaching, and, and you were cast into complete and utter darkness in some places. Peggy Sue says, I was pregnant with my firstborn and living at Fairchild Air Force Base near Spokane. I was gardening when the ash started to fall and I was so confused. I didn't hear anything that morning, but by around one in the afternoon, I was thinking I had lost track of time and certainly needed to get dinner started. The rest is history. Yeah, that's where my brother was. And uh, you know, the famous story from Spokane is that uh, the ash started coming down and the streetlights all turned on because they thought it was nighttime. Gerald says, I was a physician making rounds at Whidbey General Hospital and was in a patient room facing away from Penn Cove and heard the boom and the window rattle. Wow, that is amazing. I just saw a little notice come up on, on, on the chat that Steve Malone has been listening to this. Steve Malone is one of the most eminent uh, uh, um, volcanologists and seismologists uh, here in uh, the Pacific Northwest. And I, I think if people want to go to the chat, Steve might have put a, a reference up to some of the academic studies that have been done on the sound. And uh, those, those will explain uh, the situation much better than I've been able to do it. Um, in case that was put up by an attendee, we'll, we'll get someone to post that uh, on behalf of the team so that everyone can see it. Um, Andrea says, um, oh gosh, the memories are flooding back. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I worked for Weyerhaeuser Mortgage Company for several years and Dan Fulton was my boss. Dan ended up being CEO, now retired. Yes, it's when Weyerhaeuser had diversified into a number of businesses, including the mortgage business. They are a, a very different company now than they were back in 1980. Diane says, I also remember weeks and months after the eruption driving south on I-5 and going over the Toodle River, seeing the water line on the trees was mind boggling. Yeah, that, uh, that, you know, as those trees came down, they almost took out that bridge, both, they did take out the bridge that went over the Toodle River and they almost took out that bridge that goes over I-5. You know, a lot of those logs, I'd always assumed that those logs were uh, sort of torn by the floodwaters from the, the, the riverbanks on the way down. But if you look very carefully at those photographs, you'll see no, a lot of those logs have been delimbed and they're cut off at the end. There are the logs that were in this gigantic yard that Weyerhaeuser had up on the, the two yards that they had on the north and south forks of the Tudor River. And as those floods came through, they just took those logs and swept them downstream toward those bridges and started battering those bridges and the bridges just barely survived. Shirley says, I was living on Eby's Prairie in Coopville. I heard a huge bang, then a pause, another boom, pause, and a third boom. Later, oh, really? we thought, yes, that's what she says. And she says, later, uh, we thought the sound was bouncing off the Olympic Mountains. At the time, with no eruption information, I was nonplussed. Yeah, I'm going to have to do more research about this, obviously. There have been re these really interesting studies, and I think Steve referred to some of them there, of, uh, of people and how this sound worked. And uh, because it is the thing people remember most, I, I want to learn more about it. Anne asks, um, well, let's start with what she says. Uh, this makes her want to return to Mount St. Helens. She currently lives in Idaho, but visited Mount St. Helens several years ago with her children. Um, she now has a better understanding of the area and the eruption, thanks to your book. It's, it's an amazing thing uh, for, for people who want to try to get a, a permit to go to climb Mount St. Helens and look over it from the South Rim. That too is, a, is an amazing thing to do. It's pretty hard climb. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it now. I'm glad I got it done uh, six or eight years ago. 
There are lots of comments from folks who have enjoyed your book and are looking forward to it if they haven't read it yet. And they've enjoyed um, your presentation today and talking with you uh, through me um, and sharing their stories with you. Uh, it's up to you if you want to keep going. There are more stories, uh, but we are uh, coming up on eight o'clock. Uh, how do you feel about this, Steve? I'm, I'm always happy to talk about Mount St. Helens. Uh, that's, uh, boy, I, I could I could do that forever. So no, I'm happy to remain here, but people, I mean, an hour and a half is plenty of time to uh, to sit here and, and watch me on Zoom. I, I'm really sorry that we couldn't do this in person. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun to do in person. And then we can hang out and talk for as long as we want when we can do it in person. But let me just conclude, uh, you know, for people who want to leave right now by saying that this is one of the greatest things that can happen to a writer to have a book selected to be read by an entire community like this. It's happened to me just a few times previously and uh, 30 years of writing books. And so it's, it's really a thrill uh, for me to, to know that something like this is going on and, and appear, even if it has to be on Zoom rather than in person. Well, we're so glad that you uh, that you joined us. Um, for this. Uh, we've really enjoyed the uh, uh, adjunct programs from Cascades Volcano Observatory scientists and uh, Dave Newcomb, who is a volunteer educator at Mount St. Helens Institute. They have put together a, an incredible palette of programs to uh, kind of whet everyone's appetite for tonight. So it's been a fantastic Whidbey Reads year all around. Um, so uh, if you'd like to continue, we certainly can. Happy to, happy to continue. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's get back to some questions. Okay. For those of you who are leaving, thank you for joining, joining us. Um, we're so glad you did. Uh, in the major blast zone within a few miles from the peak, is there an estimate of the average depth of the ash? Yes, it varied dramatically. So there's sort of two separate things. There was the avalanche that came down from, uh, from the north flank of Mount St. Helens. And the depth of that can be very great. It's 200 feet around Spirit Lake, but I think there are places on the Tudor River where the, where the avalanche debris is even deeper than that. The amount of ash, varied quite a bit. It's, an, it's a really interesting question because one of the reasons that, that volcanologists knew less about these kinds of lateral eruptions and the, the blasts and the pyroclastic flows that can be generated by them is because the ash deposits don't tend to be so terribly deep that they can't be blown away or washed away by, uh, by water and rain. So they leave less of a trace uh, there for the for volcanologists to study and understand the, the processes. You know, that said though, a lot of loggers uh, that I've talked to down around there would, I mean, they were very familiar with that ground. They had dug into that ground for one reason or another, building roads. That's what John Killian did actually, he was on a road building crew. And they could see the layers of ash as they were digging cuts uh, to make these roads. And so, and knew that that ash had been laid down in previous eruptions. So they were certainly aware of the fact that eruptions could occur and could have calamitous consequences right where they were. As I said, the cone of Mount St. Helens was only 3,000 years old, and Mount St. Helens, as evidenced by those paintings that were made in the 19th century, has been erupting a lot uh, over the years, and Mount St. Helens will continue to erupt. We don't know when, but there are swarms of earthquakes that happen there all the time. Usually they're not pointing to the movement of magma, but someday uh, again, they will. We just don't know quite when it will be. The eruption of Mount St. Helens had been predicted by a, a pair of geologists just five years before it erupted. They said in, a, in an article that they wrote that it was quite possible, if not likely, that the volcano was gonna erupt uh, before the end of the 20th century. And uh, five years later, it did. Talk about a harbinger. Um, that's incredible. Um, it just speaks to the power of science. Uh, Tom asks, um, or rather it's a comment, um, the folks who were in the blast zone, in the red zone, in the, and, and in danger, they weren't breaking the law, but, but what, weren't those zones determined more by politics than the geologists' expertise? It was a it was a combination of things. As I said, there was this committee that was put together to decide where the red and blue zones were going to be. And the geologists, uh, of course, wanted the zones to be farther away. 
Uh, but there were these political and economic considerations about having where about warehousers loggers and the fact that they that, that the company wanted to continue to log that area. The loggers that I've talked to were somewhat divided. Uh, many of them would have been upset about not being able to log because of a risk that was that was uncertain. And at the time, I might have been assessed to be low. You would have gotten a lot of complaints either. You would have got a lot of complaints if they had been kicked out of that area because of uh, scientific uh, estimates of the probability of eruption. This had actually happened before at Mount Baker. About There was a really unfortunate precedent. Five years earlier, Mount Baker had acted up and a significant portion of the mountain had been closed. Many of the, the recreational organizations in places like concrete really suffered as a consequence. And then the, then the volcano didn't do anything. So it's quieted down and it's been quiet ever since. Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, too bad that that had happened when these similar decisions were being made about Mount St. Helens. Now, there's a story that I recount in the book and I won't go into all the details here, but a proposal had been made caused largely by the geologists to expand the blue zone, which would have allowed law enforcement to get almost all the people out of the areas where people were eventually killed. And that proposal was sitting on Dixie Lee Ray's desk Saturday morning waiting for her signature. And law enforcement in the area was ready to move people out of those areas. But Dixie Lee Ray was at a, uh, at a, um, a parade in Port Townsend and was not at her office on that Saturday morning. So when the uh, volcano erupted on Sunday morning, that uh, proposal was still sitting on her desk. Would Dixie Lee Ray have signed it? We don't know. She had, um, she was rather enthusiastic. She was a scientist herself and very interested in the volcano. and. Uh, took a couple of excuses to fly down there and see it um, in the two months while it was acting up. So we, we don't really know how that would have turned out. But in any event, the geologists were concerned even then that the danger zones were too close. Penelope asks, what is your research on the Toodle River salmon hatchery? She lived there. Yeah, you know, I don't know much about that salmon hatchery. I know where it is, but I have never visited it. Um, nor do I know the extent to which it was affected by the eruption, although it must have been significant because those, uh, those rivers were just clogged with sediment. They could still be, to, oh, except I think that oddly enough, the Toodle River Sand Hatchery is on the Green River and the Green River would have had less ash. So uh, the, the bottom line is, I'm afraid I don't know too, too much about that Sand Hatchery. I, I do know where it is. Dale wonders if you think there will ever be a project to dig down onto Harry Truman's Lodge. Ooh, I can't imagine why we would, why we'd want to. And uh, gosh, when you got down there, everything would just be so smashed that uh, I don't think there would be any reason to do it. You know, part of this issue, part of the difficulties about the sediment right now is that if Spirit Lake is not drained, and it's currently drained by a tunnel that was dug after the eruption through an adjacent mountain so that it drains into the Clearwater River, Say that tunnel got clogged and it is having trouble. That tunnel is, uh, is, being, is partly obstructed and water began to flow over the sediment that was over the, the avalanche debris. That avalanche debris may not be that stable and water from Spirit Lake could, could wash a lot of that stuff down the river. And that's one of the real problems and threats that uh, is still posed to these downstream communities. That water would never work its way all the way down to where Harry Truman's cabin are. But, the area around Mount St. Helens is, is, is being geologically reshaped all the time. And it's, um, who knows what will happen in the future to that mountain and what the area around it will look like. Steve, do you know what the indigenous name for the mountain is? Well, there are, it's sort of translated in different ways. The, the, the simple translation that I use is Luit. And uh, Luit is um, in the mythology of the people around there, a, a young Indian brave who um, be becomes old. The, the, the story is a rather convoluted one that has to do with the, the gods that are represented by Mount Adams and by Mount Hood, and there are various interactions among them. But the, the story, when you look at it in the historical context of what those volcanoes have done, clearly reflects the, um, the building up of Mount St. Helens, the, the building up of the cone of Mount St. Helens, and then the destruction of it over time. And we know that that has happened repeatedly during the period in which Native Americans have lived in the Pacific Northwest. So it's, 
it's entirely, it's, it's more than con conceivable. I mean, it is a fact that they watched what those volcanoes were doing and those stories were meant to convey uh, an understanding of the geological processes that were working Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is very young and active volcano. Bruce is wondering if, is forensic volcanology more difficult than forensic seismology? Yeah, there are probably people watching this uh, uh, webcast who uh, would be able to answer that question, but not me. Yeah, I don't know enough about those subjects to be able to uh, say anything about them. I, I wish I had an expert here, and I know there's experts watching who would who would be able to answer that, but I can't. Jeff has a question. Uh, is it now obvious that Dog's Head is the edge of the rim from previous similar, sim oh. similar lateral eruptions? and rebuilds of the volcano? Interesting. I don't know the answer to that question either, although I know where Dog's Head is. I've never heard that particular conjecture. I always assumed that it was simply an outpouring of lava on the flank of the volcano, but uh, a, a, a quick web search of the people who have studied Mount St. Helens, and it's been ex it was extensively studied both before 1980 and especially after 1980, would answer, would answer that question. That's an interesting conjecture, though. Uh, we have several more stories um, to read through if you if you're interested. Um, Linda uh, says, my stepson was living in Coeur d'Alene at that time. In June, he flew east to Virginia to spend the summer with us and and brought many little containers of ash. He thought he could sell them and get rich. No, <laughs> I think you can still find them on eBay. So if anybody wants one, they can always find it. Susan says, we were hiking at Blewett Pass as the mountain erupted. We thought it was dynamiting in the mountains. Hmm. Within 15 minutes, we saw a cloud of fog rolling in. Then when it arrived, they smelled sulfur and could feel the ash. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. At Blewett Pass, I hadn't realized that the ash got that far north. I thought it got pretty quickly swept up in the westerlies and blown to the east. So that's interesting. Um, in that first eruption, you know, in subsequent eruptions that occurred over the course of that summer and then for the next few years, the wind was blowing in other directions and other places got ash. But I, I hadn't realized the ash got up to blue. Jeff says, I was a six-year-old kid growing up in Castle Rock when the mountain blew. Played ball with the Smith brothers. Buzz was one of my coaches. I had many friends and teachers that lost homes in the mud flows. We grew up playing in the dredge spoils and the levees along the Cowlitz River. Regarding the morning of the mountain blowing, we didn't hear the eruption. It was my father's birthday that weekend. We had spent the weekend with my family down near Albany, Georgia, Oregon. We drove back home into the ash storm traffic. I grew up to be a geologist, huh. which ties directly to my fascination with the mountain and the mud flows. Also loved the book. Thanks for your fantastic research. Oh gosh, he knows Buzz Smith and those guys. I uh, yeah, I didn't even tell their story. That they that's another amazing story. I go into it a little bit, and Richard Wake goes into it in his book even more. Molly says, "My husband and I and our three-year-old son had just moved from Seattle to Ashford, Ashford near Mount Rainier, three weeks earlier." We had just completed a log home off the grid five miles outside Ashford when we woke up to a beautiful blue sky. We saw this huge dark cloud moving towards us from 40 miles away. Before we know it, ash covered everything as it turned eerily dark. We immediately knew the mountain had erupted. Darkness enveloped us for more than a week. It felt like the end of the world. Yeah, that's interesting. I I also didn't know that the that it had gotten as far as Ashford. I you know Randall was hit, as was Morton. So that means it got over that next ridge into that next river valley. That's interesting too. Richard says I was teaching in Eastern Washington and was at an air show at Fairchild Air Force Base near Spokane. Beautiful sunny day until we saw thunderheads to the west. We were stuck in Spokane for three days. Um. Right, because people couldn't drive. The, I've heard reports that there were traffic accidents, including deaths that were caused by all of the ash that was on the, the freeways. And there were a lot of people, I've talked to lots of people who were stranded in various places. I don't know exactly which roads were closed, but I think I-90 over the mountains was closed and people couldn't travel that way for quite some time and had to, if they were gonna make their way back to Seattle, had to find some other way to do it. Yvonne says, my friends who lived in Moy Springs, Idaho, heard the eruption. 
they spent weeks cleaning the ash on their property and had jars of ash left over. You know, that reminds me of the story that I, you know, I grew up in Othello, a, a very large agricultural area. Uh, what I've always heard is that the farmers were very concerned that the ash was going to have harmful effects on their crops, but that that turned out largely not to be the case, and that on the contrary, the next few years, they had wonderful crops. Now, volcanic ash is, can function as a, a fertilizer. And uh, so I've, I've never really read any scientific studies of the extent to which the harvests downwind were directly affected by volcanoes. But you know, when you see volcanoes in other parts of the world, you'll often see these farmers that have farms way up on the flanks of those volcanoes, even though they must understand that those volcanoes are dangerous. This often happens in Indonesia and in the, in the volcanoes around there. But it is because this ash is, is such good, creates such good soil for growing certain kinds of crops that uh, it's just too hard for them to stay away. Uh, there's, there's too much money to be made on the sides of those volcanoes. Sherry says, our best friend was a new primary care MD doing home deliveries in Pullman, Washington. He got a call and left shortly after the eruption to deliver a baby. He got three miles from the home when his car gave out because of the ash in his radiator. He walked to the home and had a successful birth and they named the baby Ashley. <laughs> Ashley, yes. Yes, I have heard about the, the Tefras and Helens and other things that uh, were, were born in the year 1980. Susan says, hi, Steve. I was in high school in Yakima when Mount St. Helens erupted. One of my science teachers mentioned that the eruption might happen that weekend. On Sunday, we couldn't see the mountain, but we saw the plume. By noon, ash was falling so heavily that it was darker than a stormy moonless night. The sky did not lighten until sunset. My brother and I had to feed the chickens, so we used an umbrella. We knew that the ashy sky would be highly, who knew that the ashy, ashy sky would be highly electrically charged. The umbrella acted as a lightning rod and we were struck by a small bolt of lightning. Really? My brother shook for the rest of the day. That's an amazing story. But you know, I, you hear just these incredible stories about the electricity that is in these ash. I, I described the people who were climbing on Mount St. Helens, I mean, on, on Mount Adams that Sunday morning, and th they would hold up their iron, uh, you know, snow axes and, uh, and, and see the sparks sort of traveling along their, their, their axes. And um, there was this one kid who had braces on his, on his teeth, and he said he could feel the electricity in his braces. So that's how charged uh, those ash clouds are. And the, you know, the amount of lightning in those, uh, in those things is supposed to be just absolutely incredible. But that's, that's a really interesting story, even way out in Yakima, that they were getting those kinds of electrical phenomena. That's, that's really wild. Carol says, uh, I was in church on Whidbey Island, and we thought something had happened on the roof. Yeah, that's right, in church. That's Cynthia says, this was a week later, my husband had hopped a freight train in Minnesota bound for Fisherman's Terminal and was amazed and choked by the ash cloud that met him in Montana all the way to Seattle. Yeah, I think Montana did get quite a bit of ash. Um, there, are, there are good maps that show the distribution of ash uh, anywhere from three, four, five inches around Ritzville and Othello. Uh, but there were places in Idaho and Montana, I think they got an inch. Corey says, thank you. Your book was a great read. I have ash in a jar from the eruption. We had to wash the ash off my grandparents' house in Napa, Napa Vine, Napa Vine, Napa Vine. Mm -hmm. uh, apologies for the pronunciation. My father and uncles had climbed the mountain and hiked Spirit Lake many times. My husband and I drove home from Portland in the ash from the initial eruption. Yeah, these jars of ash, you know, they are, they are kind of frequent. Um, sometimes I, in, uh, sometimes I bring them to my in-person book talks to make the point that this, this was sort of, you know, sm the, the smell of this ash was sort of the, the, the victims, the victims who, who choked basically on this ash. That was sort of their, their last sensation, the, the smell of that ash as they were inhaling it. And so, so these, these jars of ash have a little more significance for me when We've talked to some people, talked to family members of people who were killed in the eruption. There are just a few more stories here, Steve. James said 
I visited Mount St. Helens during my internship 10 years ago and camped on the south side and hiked among where the mud flows carried away the trees. It was very impressive. Yeah, it's really interesting to go see it now. I remember going to Mount St. Helens in the 1980s and a lot of the downed trees had been left in place in the monument so that uh, biologists could watch the process by which they decomposed and, and other living things uh, took, took their place essentially. And a lot of those downed trees are no longer there now, 41 years later. So it's really interesting to watch. I mean, it'd be interesting to go back to the south side too and see the ways that things have changed. Kim says, I was in Seattle's Green Lake area and the same thing uh, as the poster from Wallingford, no sound. They didn't hear anything. Okay. Dorothy says, we were bicycling in Olympia, Tumwater area. While we heard no sound, we were amazed at how, at how dusty the area was. Of course, it was ash. Yeah, interesting. Right, I wonder if it was, yeah, from that eruption or one of the subsequent ones in which there were a lot of communities that did get some ash from subsequent eruptions when the wind was blowing in their direction. Even, even Portland and places like that eventually got some ash. And the last uh, story that we have for you tonight, Steve, is from Lisa. She says, my mom says grandpa in Everett heard the boom, but we did not hear it in Maple Valley. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really going to do some work on this. I think I'll send Steve Malone an email after this and, and get, some of those, get some of that literature so I can see what's, see what's known about this sound. Well, that brings us to the end of the stories, uh, which have been amazing. Um, great. So thank you, Steve, so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. We certainly appreciate it. Yeah, you know, Zoom was actually almost better for stories than an in-person event because everybody could type up their stories at the same time and you could read them to me. Thanks, Marie. That was great. It's my pleasure. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna go ahead and end now and look for the recording on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. Good night. Thanks everybody.